So we decided to sterilise the slides and then place the agar solution mm. on the plates and then put them in the soil and we found we could collect nematodes quite easily. Do you know really, uh, Linda, what they eat? Well, we think that they feed on bacteria, but we're not sure because um, they might be feeding on a byproduct of bacteria. Mm. You, I mean, the bacteria get on, you think the bacteria might get onto the slide first and then the nematodes are yes. attracted there. Yes. Linda, have you tried growing your nematodes just on agar and beef broth without any bacteria there if you wash them first yes. in penicillin to try and get rid of them? Do yes. they grow on beef broth alone? No, no, we haven't found them on just beef broth. We've tried it by putting, transferring nematodes onto plates using a smear of bacteria and we found that they have lived on there mm. and multiplied for a culture. What about in, in, in the wild? Do you, what do you think is their best source of uh, bacteria and, uh, and good food in, in the soil? We think it's soil bacteria because then yes. then we, always find, we always find that when we place our agar, our agar slides in the soil, the nematodes are, are always attracted to it and possibly this, this is because bacteria is also attracted to the agar and then the nematodes are attracted to the bacteria. Emily, what use are the nematodes? Do you think they play an important part in, in, in some food cycle? Do you think they're a major part of the food, perhaps, of the earthworm? I don't think so. A lot of them, aren't there? There's a lot of them, yes, but I don't think the nematodes have to go into the earthworm for part of their life cycle. And, um, but they are, for our project, the use of it, I think, is that it's for people to become more aware of the things in the soil and yes. nature, because it's really no, I wasn't meaning what use were you doing this project. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> what sorry. use is the nematode? Does it, does it play some useful uh, we, role? In we don't know that. No. We had, we, we've never found it played any harmful part in it, because we have a theory, uh, it's very basic at the moment, that if, bacteria, if nematodes do feed on bacteria, that possibly they, they are getting rid of bacterial colonies that are arising, and so keeping the level of bacteria down in the soil, whereas if there wasn't nematodes, the bacteria level will increase and so destroy all plants. I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, girls, you can relax now and I'll have a word with Aubrey. Aubrey, I'm a little bit confused as to whether nematodes are or are not parasites. Well, great numbers of them are. You know, they often live in the intestines of, uh, of uh, big animals, including ourselves. But they live in plants, and as, as uh, the Worcester team has shown, lots of them live in the soil. They really are. They're everywhere, as Linda was saying. They're very difficult to study, though. They are fairly difficult, and I think all credit to this team for having got down to looking at a really pretty difficult animal. And uh, I like what Beverly said. I mean, we're unaware of the immense amount of life that's just teeming in the soil around us. But do you think that they've got the scientific understanding to follow it right through? Well, they've made a start. They've begun to look at factors like temperature and humidity and the presence of earthworms. I got some quibbles over their techniques. We've been arguing about them this morning, how, what's the best way to measure. But they're making a start on the right lines. And the measurements are right, are they? I think so far as they go, they're OK, yes. So if they brushed up on that side, they'd be on to a very valuable thing indeed. I think they're, they've got something really good here and it can develop much further. Thank you very much indeed, Aubrey. Thank you also, Linda and Beverly, and of course, Shelley. <laughs> the northeast of England is our next port of call with a team from the Royal Grammar School in Newcastle. They're interested in farming and particularly in the crop sprayer, which is a very, very useful piece of equipment on any farm. But there's one big snag and that's the weight of water that we have to carry on the tractor, about 20 gallons for every acre. And in soft land, this can cause rutting, in which crushes and tears at the young plants. As members of our school project team building a hovercraft, we decided to try and adapt the hovercraft as a new type of crop sprayer. It was this new development that enabled us to spray with the hovercraft. It creates a very fine mist by dribbling water through this tube onto the rotating head and it uses about a twentieth of the amount of water as a conventional sprayer does and so we have a lot less weight to carry on the hovercraft. 
The first thing we had to decide was the width of boom we needed, and we thought 20 foot was the right width. Each spray head has a spray of 4 foot, so we needed 5 spray heads for this. Then we had to decide where and how to carry the liquid to feed the spray heads. As the craft has to be balanced, we decided two small tanks would be better than one single one. These we positioned at the front, one on either side of the lift motor. Each tank feeds the two outside heads on its respective side. The centre head is fed from both tanks. This ensures that the levels in the tanks are equal. One of the major problems is keeping the hovercraft in a straight line, so we decided we'd have to fit some wheels to steer the hovercraft and stop it from drifting sideways. We fitted two small wheels at the back, which are steered by a system of link rods. We fitted one larger wheel at the front to stop the front end from swinging about. We fitted a speedo onto the front wheel so that we could keep the speed accurate, which is required for the type of spraying we're doing. Now that we can drive the hovercraft in a straight line, we have to have a system to see where we've been. We've designed our own version of the foam marker system. This uses the boom to carry the foam to this nozzle, which dribbles onto the ground and makes a mark. Now that the craft is complete, we're going to do some field trials on it to test its efficiency. We're also going to compare the results we get with those obtained by a conventional system. So to the questioning, starting with Heinz Wolf. Uh, Paul, a hovercraft are not new, and crop spraying with small volumes of liquids are, isn't new. So what, where would you say the real originality in your project was? Well, I think it is that no one's ever successfully managed to use a crop sprayer on a hovercraft before. And what's, what's been the chief reason for that? Well, there's been two chief reasons. That the, um, one of them is that a hovercraft can't carry much weight, and for mm -hmm. normal spraying you need a lot of water. But this system doesn't use very much water. And the second system is that uh, these steer wheels to steer it. Um, a hovercraft is normally very difficult to steer and these wheels are to help it and, it, and now we can steer it very accurately. And for crop spraying, this accurate steering isn't, is essential, is it? Yes, oh yes, you have to go in exact straight lines. In putting on wheels, Alistair, you've gone away a bit from the, the hovercraft principle, haven't you? Um, did you think of going further and putting the drive on the wheels? Well, we're considering this now, along with another alternative of uh, fitting a variable prop it would be, uh, make the speed very accurate if you did have driven wheels because you could speak, uh, fix the engine revs to give uh, the desired speed. But uh, this might cause as much problems as a tractor with the, uh, the wheels tearing the ground. Yes. Yeah, I mean, your versatility is that you can go over really very soft surfaces and uh, uh, the, the wheels at, the, at present taking no, taking no drive at all will let you do that. But I, do you really think that that's that uh, going back to driving by the wheels is a way forward? Well, I don't know. We're going to investigate this, mm. and uh, it's a question of which is the more feasible. Why is it necessary to have such accurate speed? I don't quite understand that. Well, the chemical's got to be sprayed on at the right dosage per acre, mm -hmm. and uh, you've got to have the speed right to have this done. Whilst we're on the wheels, you made them yourself, didn't you, yourself? How did you, it's a strange design with these uh, spokes sticking out, how did you decide that that was the right length of spoke and that was the way to do it, uh, Paul? Um, well, we tried longer spokes at first, um, but we found they got too much grip in the ground and it, it uh, was too much force on the wheels, so we just uh, shortened them until they were the right length. So a trial and error. Yes, yes. How does she perform on hills, Paul? Um, well, with these wheels on, it's very good at going sideways across a hill because you can, you can hold it, whereas a normal hovercraft would slide down. But, um, uh, and it's all right going up the hill because it's being thrusted by the fans, but coming down, uh, we found that we've got no braking system on it. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you going to do about that? Well, we've um, thought of two ideas. One is we can fit brakes to the existing wheels. Or, secondly, we could have um, a propeller that you can feather to produce, and produce a, a reverse thrust to mm -hmm. slow it down. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked uh, much about the spraying, Alistair. Uh, are there any difficulties with the air from under the skirt blowing the spray around uh, where you don't want it? Well, I don't think so. Um, 
In fact, it might even help the spray by uh, getting it all round the plant and so covering all the leaves. Is there anything, any other jobs I could do with this machine, if I bought myself one? Um, yes, well, we're very good for spreading seed uh, for things like turnips and oilseed rape because we can put a, a small electric broadcast spreader on the back and it can uh, quite easily spread seed as well. So, and the weights are right? I mean, you wouldn't have to go and keep on stopping and putting another bag of seed in? Oh, no, because things like turnips and oilseed rape, you only need a few pounds per acre, so you could put, carry a lot on it. Right, assessment time again, and on this occasion it's with Heinz Wolf. Heinz, are you convinced that this could be a practical proposition? I think, I think it's, it's, it's exceedingly plausible. Um, one, has a, one has a feeling that hovercraft are rather sensitive and fragile um, machines, but I believe that uh, Paul and Alistair have thought of this, and they really intend to make the next model with a steel frame and aluminium skin so that the farmer can't put his boots through it. It's got to be a little bit more rugged than this one is. Yes, I think they have to, they have to really think in aeroplane technology a bit more than, than tractor technology because weight really matters a lot. But people have got pretty good at making, at making light aeroplanes. And I think these are, these are engineering problems which are not expensive to solve. On the other hand, you were pointing out that really they haven't just solved engineering problems. They've also put in uh, quite a deal of ingenuity into it. Well, I think uh, there, there was an initial act of lateral thinking of putting two recent developments. This question of, of being able to uh, spray crops with very much smaller volumes, using very much smaller particles, which was a development in one field of technology and a small hovercraft technology in other fields, and they put it together. And many good inventions are putting two things together, which then seem terribly obvious once somebody's done it. So never does it had to be done. So there we are, Heinz, thank you, and thank you also the team from Newcastle. You may be on to a very good invention there. Now, this year, the judges will be scoring each of the teams out of 100 points. I would like to point out, though, that those points are awarded not just on the basis of the question and answer sessions that you've seen during the programme, but also upon literally hours of conversation between the judges and the teams, and also upon even more hours of studying their project notes. Now, to give Sir George and Aubrey and Heinz, just a few moments to make up their minds about this week's teams. Let's have a look at some of the things in store in next week's programme. From Oxford, equations with a difference. From Halifax, what's the use of grass? And from Malvern, some faults in the hills. All that and more next week, but now this week's scores from Sir George Porter. Well, taking the, the three teams in the order in which we saw them, first to Lanark for their discovery that the textbooks are not always right, for their excellent experiments uh, with which they've pursued the problem in a logical, scientific way, the judges give 73 marks. <laughs> Second to Worcester for making a good start on the study of some rather elusive animals and the way they live in the soil, we give 65. <laughs> and last, but by no means least, Newcastle, for their successful engineering of a working hovercraft sprayer, which is novel and potentially very useful, and for the enormous amount of work that they've put into it, the judges have given 82. <laughs> so today's winners are Newcastle. We'll be seeing them again in four weeks' time when they'll have a chance of becoming Young Scientists of the Year 1978. Goodbye. <laughs>